this is a, a kind of an introductory to vascular surgery on arterial uh, disease involving the lower limbs. One of the common problems that you will face uh, in uh, the surgical OPD. See a patient walking in into the OPD with uh, toe gangrene is uh, one of the common problem. But we should be able to pick it up even before the patient develops this kind of a gangrene. That is what is important. See, let's look at... Uh, Um, I'll have to call you later, Bob. So let's uh, look at the etiology of uh, chronic lower limb ischemia. So uh, the common ones are earlier, like when I was a student, the common one used to be the Burgess disease. Now the Burgess disease has come down. And what we see majority are atherosclerotic patients. Then comes the Burgess disease. It is still there, not that it is not there. Then iota arthritis, which is an inflammatory arthritis. Vasculitis, that also can produce. It's a different kind of inflammatory arterial disease. Then sometimes neglected vascular trauma, like a patient undergoing a fracture, having a fracture or undergoing a knee replacement. Uh, they do develop uh, an arterial injury to the popliteal and uh, later present with ischemia. Then there are congenital ones like uh, popliteal entrapment and adventitial cystic disease, which uh, etiology of it, we are not very clear about. So um, symptom wise, what do these patients present? Claudication, as you all know, when the patient walks a particular distance, gets the pain, and then he stops for a while and the pain goes. The reason for this is uh, in under resting conditions, the existing blood flow is enough to maintain the circulation of the muscles. But when the patient starts walking, uh, there is an increased oxygen demand, which because of the uh, arterial occlusion, it's not able to supply and the patient develops pain. The moment he takes rest, the oxygen demand of the muscles comes down and the pain is disappear. Pain disappears. See, so the, the difference between uh, neuritic pain, like you have a uh, cord compression, which also pro will produce a similar kind of a pain. But the difference between a uh, Claudication and the neuritic pain, which is called the pseudo claudication, is that here the pain will come exactly. Let us say, patient develops pain after walking 50 uh, feet. The pain, patient takes rest, the pain goes, and again the patient can walk another 50 feet, and the pain goes completely on taking rest. Whereas in the neurogenic claudication, the pain does not disappear totally. By taking rest, the, in, uh, the pain intensity comes down, but does not disappear totally. So patient is unable to walk the same distance again and over a period of time is not able to walk at all. That does not happen with an arterial claudication. This is a very classical way of uh, differentiating. Then as the uh, arterial block increases and the collateral flow to the distal, uh, distal leg uh, reduces, the walking distance keeps on coming down. Earlier the pain is after walking 50 feet, then it starts slowly reducing that he's not able to walk even at home. And then at that time, even a small injury is enough to precipitate an ulcer. And once the ulcer comes, the pain shifts to the ulcer. It becomes a rest pain localized to the ulcer. So rest pain is when the patient is having pain even at rest, uh, which is due to ischemic neuritis. The nerves in that area the, are suffering from severe lack of oxygen and they produce severe pain. So disturbing the sleep. And then over a period of time, gangrene will set in. This is the classical progression of a claudication to a critical ischemia and then to gangrene. So uh, in these patients, you must look for uh, pulses. There are various places the pulses are palpable. Uh, in the lower limb, you can feel, start from the iota. You can feel the iota, you can feel the femoral, you can feel the popliteal. There are two ways of feeling popliteal. One, a patient lying supine with the knee bent in this position, when you feel the popliteal, you're um, actually feeling the distal popliteal artery. Or somewhere you can say mid-popliteal artery against the femoral uh, condyle. You're feeling against the femoral condyle. But when you put the patient prone and then feel for the pulse, you're actually feeling the distal popliteal against the tibial condyle. 
So you can feel the popliteal pulse. You can feel uh, the uh, dorsal spidis, posterior tibial. And many a times you can also feel the anterior tibial artery in the lower leg. So in upper limb, you must learn to palpate the radial artery, ulnar artery, uh, the brachial artery. You can feel the axillary artery high up in the axilla and then the subclavian artery uh, in the supraclavicular fossa. So these are the pulses that can be felt. And over the pulses, you should put a step and see whether you can hear a brui. The presence of a brui indicates that there is turbulence, that there is an obstruction to the blood flow. Then there are uh, changes in the skin that happens, chronic changes. Um, that I, I'll show you a, a typical picture which will give you an idea. Then some of these patients can present with acute phlebitis. So when a patient presents with acute phlebitis without any uh, predisposing cause, except for smoking, you should look for all the pulses. It could be a feature of uh, the arterial disease. Both atherosclerosis as well as like a Burgess disease can produce phlebitis. But of course, it is traditionally more associated with the inflammatory arteries. When you strongly suspect arterial occlusion, but you think the pulses are felt, it could be because the pulse may be feeble. And when there is a, a proximal occlusion through excellent collaterals, you may still feel a distal pulse, but the pressure will be low. You can make it more apparent if you make the patient do that exercise. Let us say the patient's symptoms come after walking 50 feet. You make the patient walk 50 feet and re-examine. When, when you do that, the pulse will disappear or they may even develop a, a brui which was not there earlier, you can develop it. Or a pulse that was there disappears. So uh, this is a post-exercise testing which is also very important. Then a Lerish syndrome is a classical thing that you would have heard. It, uh, typically, it is for a chronic disease where there is a gluteal claudication due to um, internal iliac occlusion, bilateral internal iliac occlusion, impotence, and absent uh, femoral pulses. So this was described by uh, Lerish. So now it is kind of loosely applied for all iatile blocks that there is a Lerish syndrome. Then you see here a patient which is very typical on the left side. The muscle is wasted, uh, the hair is lost, uh, absolutely the subcutaneous fat is gone. There are nail changes, ulcer, the veins are collapsed. These are all features, typical features of uh, chronic uh, uh, lower limb ischemia. Then in diabetic patients, you may not get the classical pain. So that you may get a patient presenting with numbness and Sometimes an ulcer, like you see here, a yeah, big toe. It's an ulcer. Actually, what you are seeing is the terminal phalanx. The nail is missing from this. And uh, you can see the nail changes in other toes. In the big toe, what you are seeing is the white uh, thing is the um, distal phalanx. And there's absolutely no evidence of granulation. And the patient does not have any pain because of neuropathy. So that is why the diagnosis gets delayed in these patients. In some fire up people, you can actually see the color change. This is the typical ruber that you will get, ischemic ruber. You elevate this leg, the ruber will disappear. You hang the leg down, the ruber will come. This is due to uh, stagnation of uh, cyanotic blood that happens due to vasodilatation in these patients. And the other term that you must know is the critical limb ischemia. What is critical limb ischemia? This is an ischemic rest pain for over two weeks which requires analgesia for pain relief. And in these patients, the ankle pressure will be 50 millimeters or less, toe pressure can be 30 millimeters or less. For diabetic patients, this pressure can be slightly higher, like 70 for ankle and 50 for toe, because majority of the time, the, the limb vessels are calcified in diabetes. So abnormally, even though the flow is less, the pressure may be high. Or sometimes you can present in diabetic people with ulcer or gangrene with similar pressure, even if there is no pain. So critical ischemia is like a semi-emergency. So you will have to do some revascularization for these patients. So it's very important who falls into the critical limb ischemia. Then what are the investigations that are available for the lower limb ischemia? A segmental pressure, ankle brachial index, which is very important, duplex scan, and angiogram. Angiograms can be conventional, DSA, CT angios, and MR angiograms with or without contrast. You can also add a carbon dioxide angiogram in this. 
So segmental arterial pressure normally actually does that uh, very seriously. It, it used to be started off like between segments. If there is a drop of pressure more, more than 15 millimeters of mercury, that indicates there is a, an, a, a problem in this segment. There is an arterial occlusion in this segment. But what is important is the toe pressure because ankle pressures can be fallacious. Uh, the digital artery does not get calcified so much as the tibial arteries. That is, toe pressure usually is 5 to 10 millimeters less than brachial, 20 to 30 millimeters less than ankle, and it's more reliable because less calcified and useful for uh, uh, foot healing or toe amputation healing. Ankle brachial index is one of the most important non-invasive tests. It's a very, very simple test. can be done at the bedside. All you need is a pocket Doppler and a blood pressure apparatus. Normal pressures are uh, uh, 0 0.9 to 1. That is, the, normally the ankle pressures are slightly higher than the brachial pressure. So you get 1 or above in uh, the ankle brachial index. But in mild claudication, you classify it as mild claudication if the ankle pressure is above 0.6 and moderate if it is between 0.6 and 0.4 and severe if it is less than 0.4. If there is less than 0.3, that means it's an impending gangrene. So it's very important for us to plan treatment. If it is a mild claudication, there's no need for any invasive treatment. We can actually treat them medically. Then the other important investigation is the duplex scan. This is a grayscale ultrasound along with, uh, which will tell you the anatomical details. And you can also get the hemodynamic data by the Doppler examination. That's why it's called duplex. So it gives you both anatomical and physiological data. It's most useful non-invasive test. If, the, if we can find out is there a significant arterial occlusion, paramount of this thing on anatomical location, hemodynamic significance of multi-level blocks. So see, sometimes you get a block in the thigh, you can, in the femoral, you can have a block in the popliteal, you can have the block in the tibial. So you can examine all the levels. You can come to the ankle level and see how much is the blood flow and decide then uh, which is the one which is causing the maximum problem. And so it helps you to decide on therapeutic option. And most important is follow. After you have done something for the patient, you can keep a non-invasive follow-up in these patients by simply doing a uh, duplex scan and ankle brachial index. See Doppler, you must know a little bit of it. This is uh, the Doppler shift, which is um, made into a graph. I, I'll make it as, as simple as that, that you have a piezoelectric crystal in the Doppler probe. One crystal to send the Doppler and another crystal to receive the Doppler. See the Doppler that hits the skin, hits the blood vessel, and it is altered by the moving column of blood. So the frequency shifts and this is reflected back and the, um, it is caught again by the other piezoelectric crystal, which measures the shift in the frequency of the Doppler wave uh, by the moving column of blood. This shift is put on a graph and you get a picture like this. So you get what is called a triphasic flow. You can see here on the left side, the first picture, you can see a sharp peak up that is the systolic peak, and then the diastole. When there is a diastole, the, actually the vessel contracts because of the elasticity. So you get a zero crossing. That is it. when actually there is no flow in the forward flow at that point in the artery. So if there is a zero crossing, and then below, because of the elasticity, there is a rebound. So when there is a rebound, then again, you get a smaller peak. So you get one, systolic peak, one diastolic uh, uh, zero crossing peak, and then again a rebound. This is called a triphasic flow. Any uh, leg which has got a normal blood flow in the peripheral arterial system, you get a triphasic flow. As the occlusion starts, then you can see here the systolic peaks becoming smaller, becoming wider. That is the time taken to reach that peak systolic velocity gets slower because the blood flow is less. And then instead of a sharp uh, peak, you get a smooth curve like that. And the first thing to disappear when the artery becomes stiff is the zero crossing, the negative flow. So it's always, then it becomes a biphasic flow. And then later, it becomes just a small, smooth curves like that, which is a monophasic flow. So this is how 
a disease progression can be assessed by looking at the Doppler wave. Now, you see here in this uh, middle picture, the first one, what is mentioned as a common carotid. Common carotid, the flow is both right basic and that is a high resistant and low resistant flow. So it is a combination of both. And the middle one is the internal carotid. That is at no point of time, you can have absence of forward blood flow in the artery because the brain needs that, not like a peripheral artery. So there is no zero crossing in the internal iliac. Internal iliac is a low resistance flow. Whereas you see the external iliac, which is typical of a triphasic flow, which what you get in uh, the peripheral vessels. See, like you see here, the, you can get an anatomical picture. You can see the femoral artery with branches. You can, the upper one, you can see the carotid artery with external and internal carotid. And from there, Doppler tra tracing can be done and you can assess the blood. So a word about uh, Berger's disease. See, Berger's disease, the typical diagnostic criteria was given by Shionaya in 1990. That is onset before the age of 50. It can be both male and uh, female, but majority are in males. Absent atherogenic risk factors except smoking. That is, smoking is very common. That is, absence of hypertension, diabetes at the time of onset. Later years, because like India is the diabetic capital of the world, so people will develop diabetes even though they may be having a Burgess disease. But at the time of onset, younger age, they do not have diabetes. Then they must have infrapopulative disease. They can also have in the disease in the iota iliac areas. Then upper limb involvement is very common and migrating phlebitis is very, very typical of these patients. In, in angiographically, it is very different from atheromas. Like uh, classical atheromatous changes will not be there. The proximal artery is very smooth. There is a sudden cutoff, segmental disease, and then there is a leash of collateral from that block, which gives the tree root appearance. And the collaterals are like a corkscrew and very, very small vessels because they are prone for spasm. Like you see here, the femoral artery is replaced by a corkscrew collateral. Since it is an inflammatory arthritis, there is a, a recanalization that happens, uh, which develops like a corkscrew. It is actually going around the artery. If you open up and see, it will be a recanalized channel going around the artery. And it's actually not the main lumen. So this is very typical of a uh, Burgess. Like you see here, sudden cutoff of the popliteal artery replaced by uh, tree root collaterals. And again, the same patient having an occlusion of the posterior tibial artery replaced by a tree root collateral. These are very typical of uh, Burgess disease. And here you see an atherosclerotic artery, multiple stenosis, multiple stenosis, both profunda and uh, uh, the femoral artery. This is the tibial artery. You can see here, all of them are showing stenosis. Then you see here the middle picture is actually without any contrast. It's just a plain X-ray of the leg. It shows extensive calcification, which is uh, the monkey bark calcification, calcification, which is uh, typical in diabetic people, which is very common in India. And uh, because of this calcification, there will be a lot of blocks and very difficult to get in the CT angiogram. The CT angiogram is pretty good. We get uh, good imaging and uh, there are now um, uh, special software available where we can actually remove the calcium and get a good luminal uh, pictures in these patients. And you see here a contra, I mean, MR angiogram, that MR angiogram in, in this patient, you can actually see a small aneurysm, small aneurysm in the iota. And he already has undergone a bypass surgery on the left side. That now he has come with the disease on the right side, multiple stenosis in the femoral artery. In, in the other side, you could see here CT angio showing extensive calcified vessels. Then we have in MR angiogram, we use gadolinium as the contrast. So gadolinium has uh, one of the serious complication is um, uh, nephrosclerosis, that it produces sclerosis of the nephrons, thereby producing permanent uh, renal damage. So it is, uh, it is not an advisable investigation, if, even if there is some mild uh, renal damage. So in these patients, what we can do is non-contrast that is, without giving any contrast, 
can imaging can be done of the artery like you see in this patient the left side there is a sudden occlusion of the external iliac artery with the reformation of the profunda and a little bit of the tibial arteries that are seen but it's not as good as the uh, ct but some kind of a road map we can get you must remember that atherosclerosis is a systemic disease it does not involve only uh, the legs the patient usually has diabetes hypertension ischemic heart disease even it can have a carotid disease hypercoagulopathy uh, hyperlipidemia and among the hyperlipidemia uh, hypercoagulability one of the most important thing is the homocysteine homocysteine has been identified as a typical risk factor for uh, younger patients developing atherosclerotic disease in all over the world and especially in india and um, let me uh, stress on this point of smoking uh, smoking is one of the most important causative factor for the arterial disease smoking uh, means just not only smoking it indicates every tobacco intake will produce trouble to the arterial tree the various ways uh, tobacco can damage is on the endothelium on the platelets increase uh, decreases the fibrinolysis thereby the clot removal is reduced on coagulation increases the viscosity increase fibrinogen the people who uh, with heavy smokers come with the hemoglobin of 16 and 17 or even 18 with the pcv of uh, uh, 50 plus for increasing the viscosity and thereby producing um, thrombosis and it's a typical vaso constrictor that has been demonstrated again and again if a patient is treated gets well and resumes smoking the disease will come back very quickly so we have to really impress upon them about the uh, risks of smoking so uh, how do we manage these patients having diagnosed we don't do angiogram for all the patients if the patient has only mild claudication patient must be put on medical management and angiograms are done only for intervention not otherwise so the most important thing is only two stop smoking and keep walking that is our slogan so if they don't stop smoking nothing is going to work we must impress upon them that and the third important thing is a foot cap by walking barefoot not wearing a proper footwear many a times ulcers are produced and it leads to gangrene and the limb loss so you have to advise them about proper footwear then all these patients are put on antiplatelet drugs the common one is our aspirin clopidogrel and uh, celestrozole which is a weak antiplatelet drug uh, which has got other uh, vasodilator properties so celestrozole is a new addition the dipyridamol and cyclopidine are no longer used then we have this pentoxifen and hemorrheological agent which is not available freely now and then is there a role for specific vasodilator I mean, a lot of people put on this uh, drugs like duodenal and say cy this uh, cyclandulate and things like that no there is no role for vasodilators in a chronic low limb ischemia because the limbs the vasculature is already maximally vasodilated ischemia itself is a Uh, causes severe vasodilation that's why you get a rubber so only in vasospastic disease let us say a burgers disease or vasculitis you can add some vasodilator not otherwise same way prostaglandins are also useful only for uh, the inflammatory arterial disease then there is a device called art assist device that is intermittent pneumatic compression like uh, all our uh, people are um and then they get immense relief by compression of the leg everybody compresses the leg whenever there is a leg pain indirectly they are actually producing a pumping action of the blood flow thereby giving relief to the patient so uh, the yeah this device does exactly the same intermittent compression is done uh, mechanically then all the risk factor modifications like controlling hypertension diabetes hyperlipidemia congestive failure weight reduction correcting the hypercoagulopathy renal failure homocysteinemia all these things help towards improving the blood circulation so a patient should be put on all these drugs and only when it does not work then you must suggest angiogram and anything to be done later when do we do uh, surgery the classical indications are a disabling claudication limb threatened ischemia and arterio arterial embolism we don't do for a uh, simple claudication what is disabling claudication you see it varies from patient to patient a young man who is a, a hard worker 
if he gets pain on walking one kilometer, it is disabling for him. Whereas an old person, retired man who does not do much of a walking, if he gets pain after one kilometer, it is not disabling for him. So a patient like that can be maintained on medical management. Whereas a young patient who has to be fit and running, uh, it will become a disabling for the patient. Of course, when the patient presents with ulcers or ischemic ulcers or wrist pain or gangrene, you have to intervene. Only time you, you may have a palpable pulse, but the patient develops a gangrene is due to shower of emboli from a proximal lesion. There also, you have to operate. So what, what are the different operation, uh, surgeries that are available to us? Endarterectomy, if there is a localized block. Bypass, if it's a long block. Then for completion sake, I'm talking of lumbar sympathectomy. And there are others like uh, indirect surgeries like omentopexy, tibia corticotomy, spinal cord stimulation, gene therapy. These are all things that are not done anymore. Of course, there are people who are still doing it, but not uh, absolutely scientific. See, and then you must know a little bit about uh, grafts. What are the best grafts? The aloe grafts are the best. That is, the venous graft is the best. If the vein graft is not available, you, you also can have arterial homograft, but it's very limited. You can you have radial artery, you can have internal iliac artery, nothing more. Umbilical vein graft is uh, available, and, and cryopreserved vein, cryopreserved iotas are available. And then the other things I've just mentioned only for completion's sake. Then what about a prosthetic graft? See, ideal prosthetic graft is still not available. So we have the ideal one, you, you can see all these, uh, it has to be compliant, low cost, non-thrombogenic, impervious to blood leakage, so many things are there. But all the grafts cannot satisfy everything. We have uh, the textile grafts, which is the Dacron. Now a lot of advantages, uh, advances have been done. We don't uh, routinely use this woven and knitted graft that used to be done earlier. Now we have biologically coated. They're all coated with albumin or gelatin so that they don't leak and they are softer and they're really easy to handle. And the next one is the PTFE. These two are the ones that are commonly used now. And the recent advantage, uh, adv advances are we have endothelial seeding. That is endothelial cells are seeded onto the graft so that the new intima that forms will grow faster. Biodegradable, which is the latest, where you develop a, a scaffolding for that. And the scaffold, uh, fibrocollagenous tissue grows around this scaffold. This becomes like a graft, which is removed and used as a bypass graft later. So it's a little complicated stuff. Then we have apparent bonding to the uh, graft to prevent clotting and antibiotic impregnated to prevent infection. All these are available now. Then let me tell you region-wise, what are the things that we do? Iotoilate blocks, we used to classify them like this, type one, two, and three. Type one is limited to bifurcation, two is extending on to uh, the iliacs, and uh, type three goes, going to the external iliac as well as crossing the inguinal ligament, like in this thing, but now uh, we have given up the, that one. Now we have a other classification called task classification, where, which is also uh, almost similar, A, B, C, and D. A is a localized disease, B is also a little bit localized, C and D are more advanced diseases involving multiple segments. Like a patient like this, this is like a task uh, A disease, localized to the bifurcation. You can see here, we can do an endarterectomy. But now a patient like this, we would probably do a stenting in this patient. Here you see an endarterectomy. Uh, by endarterectomy, we mean we remove the intima and remove half the uh, media. That is, we leave behind the external elastic lamina. Internal elastic lamina, half the media and the intima are removed in this. So you can see here, the iota has been cleaned up and then we close it with a patch. Where um, bigger or longer blocks, we use this iota iliac uh, bypass graft. And uh, then um, you see here, if the patient is not fit for um, iotic surgery, uh, then we'll have to do with poor LV function, hostile abdomen, multiple surgeries have been done, severe in, infection or uh, uh, malignancy. We'll have to think of doing an extra anatomic bypass, which is, can be femorofemoral, axillofemoral, or optary bypass, depending on the block. Like you see here, a patient having unilateral iliac disease, we can take from one femoral to the other femoral, from here to there. So that is a femoral femoral, which is an easy surgery, can be done under local anesthesia and tolerated well. Or an axillofemoral, we can get 
the graft that start from the axillary artery going down to the femoral artery and from one femoral to the other femoral, axillofemoral bypasses can be done. Uh, but see, now aortic surgeries have reduced tremend uh, tremendously because the advancement in the endovascular procedures. We do majority of these aortic blocks with the endovascular lesions. But one surgery which is very, very important is the femoral endotracheal. Like you can see in this patient, common femoral and the SFA origin has a very, very tight lesion causing near total occlusion. So this one can be easily managed by an endotrectomy and all these things can be closed with a patch, thereby enlarging the uh, opening so that blood flow to the limb can be increased. Then as you move down infragenicular area, reverse saphenous vein is the vein of choice. Most commonly used convy, best uh, patency rates, long saphenous is the best. If it is not available, we can take from short saphenous or even cephalic vein. And you see here, we can make such long incisions or uh, multiple small incisions, the vein can be harvested. We even have an endoscopic uh, vein harvest where we can make small cuts and we can uh, harvest it using a laparoscopic technique that can be done. So you see here a bypass from the popliteal artery to the anterior tibial artery. Uh, we can do bypass to almost the, all the vessels. We can go down to the dorsalis pedis and we can go down even to the plantar artery. Up to that point, we can do a bypass and uh, produce excellent results and limb salvage. And when the vein is not available here, you see the upper limb cephalic vein in the arm has been harvested and connected to the saphenous vein and we get a long uh, graft available. Sometimes uh, a radial artery can be harvested. When the vein is not available, we use this PTFE, like you can see here, a femoropopliteal bypass done by a PTFE graft. Then um, in, there is something called an in situ bypass, which is where the vasa vasorum is preserved. We don't uh, remove the vein completely. The vein is left in situ and uh, uh, the, that is, so the advantage is we don't damage the vein, the intima is viable and uh, it is less thrombogenic and the upper vein is used to the upper artery and the lower vein to the lower artery, thereby there is a better vein uh, utilization and match. So here you can see here, the vein is not lifted from the vein and the valves are disrupted by a valvulotome. Then here you can see the valvulotome, uh, first one is the lemeth valvulotome, below is the wall, uh, uh, Mills valvulotome, you can, Hall's valvulotome, you can see here, this is the uh, valvulotome which has got a cutting edge. With that, we cut the uh, valve and make it incompetent. Like you see here, compared to other vein, the, here the anastomosis has already been done. The vein is in its uh, place and we close the, it is underneath in its natural bed, separate in its plane. And through the side branches, we cut the valves. Like here, you can take, we have done a posterior tibial bypass uh, way up to the ankle with the same technique. Then a word about uh, lumbar sympathectomy. You see, it improves the cutaneous flow, helps in healing of ulcers, relieves the rest pain, but there is no improvement of muscle flow. So it is not indicated for claudication at all. So we reserve a lumbar sympathectomy only as an adjuvant procedure or when the procedure is, I mean, no vascular surgery is possible. So what we do also, we don't do open surgery. We do a chemical sympathectomy more than open sympathectomy. Now, what are the results after uh, uh, this lower limb bypasses? Iotoiliac uh, bypass is an excellent result, 80 to 90 percent. Pempop above knee has 70 percent. Below knee is around 60 percent. With the, with the vein, when you use a prosthetic graft, it reduces to 40 percent. And what is more important is even if it stays patent for a few years, it will maintain the palatal flow and thereby, uh, uh, even if it gets occluded, it does not cause any uh, limb ischemia. It can, it still work. Complications, the standard complications, hemorrhage, uh, edema, wound infection, false aneurysm, there is infection at the site. Uh, thrombosis, early thrombosis is usually due to technical error or uh, very poor runoff. Intermediate one is the clam site stenosis on intimal hyperplasia. Later, one, beyond one year problems are due to progression of disease. Then comes the uh, transluminal angioplasty, which is 
great advancement in the management of uh, vascular occlusion. This is started in 64, uh, where we use an inelastic balloon, which can dilate to a predetermined diameter, thereby it causes the vessels to dilate. What does it do? Radial shearing force, it cracks the intima, and there is a controlled dissection, and it stretches the media and intima, uh, adventitia, causing a dilatation, and later, the vessel remodels by itself. Like you see here, we are not removing the plaque. The plaque is compressed and shifted, and thereby we are creating a lumen which is uh, bigger than what we started with. Uh, originally, it was started for focal short lesions, less than five centimeters, stenosis rather than uh, total occlusion, non-calcified lesions, and a very good uh, distal runoff. Now, endovascular interventions are done for, uh, more liberally. The advantages of uh, endovascular interventions are uh, lower morbidity, mortality, shorter uh, hospitalization, early patient recovery and ambulation, limb salvage, same as open surgery. Hence, it is now used more extensively as the uh, first line treatment. Uh, the le uh, disadvantages are it is less durable and there is a need for re intervention. Like you see here, this is the uh, PTA standard balloon. You have the blue one is the one for distending the uh, balloon, and the white one is for passing the wire. It is always worked on a wire. Now, like you see here, a uh, uh, femoral artery, you've got a tight lesion and a moderate lesion. Uh, this can be dilated by a balloon and post dilatation, excellent run. There is no residual stenosis. So you can avoid a major bypass in this patient. Like in this proximal popliteal artery, a similar result. We can do that even for long lesions. Like the entire SFA, the profunda is dilated nicely, but the entire SFA is occluded. We have dilated with the balloon. But uh, long lesions like this, when you uh, do, they tend to recur very quickly. So we normally don't advise this. We do it only for patients who are unfit for open surgery. And uh, the problem in uh, angioplasty, elastic recoil, intimal hyperplasia, and residual stenosis. So when the residual stenosis is more than 30%, you must put a stent for these patients. Or when there is extensive dissection, a chronic total occlusion, you have done it for a total occlusion, or recurrent stenosis after PTA. And so here, the same principle in uh, this also. And uh, the stent is applied across the stenosis, dilated, and it maintains the uh, stenosis. The various uh, met, um, types are available. It can be balloon expandable, self-expanding, bioabsorbable, or drug-eluting stent. Like you see here in uh, common iliac occlusion, total occlusion, we have crossed it with the wire. That's the white line that you're seeing, and over which a stent can be placed. Like you see here, a stent has been placed and dilated, and you see here all the collaterals have disappeared, and there is a free flow of contrast into the iliac artery. So otherwise, this patient would have required a major surgery like a femoral or an iatrofemoral bypass. This is what I was telling an iatroiliac lesion, task A and B, A and B, a lesion like this would have required a major iatric surgery. One of the complications of iatric surgery is the impotence, which is very, very important. So this can be tackled by a kissing balloon technique. That is two balloons are placed across and we are actually creating a new uh, um, uh, iatroiliac uh, junction. We can even do that to uh, uh, iotic occlusions. We can put a stent across and avoid a major surgery, uh, retaining all the collateral flow. Whenever the lesion is pretty long, uh, we have different techniques. Like you can see in the first picture, the wire is coming from below. We have a retrograde puncture where we can puncture the popliteal artery and push the wire up and retrieve the wire from the top and dilate the entire lesion and stent it, thereby avoid a uh, femoropopliteal bypass. We can do that to tibial artery. Now the advancement is small, long balloons. The entire length of the tibial artery can be dilated with a single balloon. Thereby, uh, we can actually uh, dilate all the three vessels, the peroneal, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, thereby improving the blood flow, the target area, which is actually the foot, and hopefully the foot lesion heals. What are the advanced, uh, what are the endo processes is the, one of the recent advanced where there is a, a stent with a graft. 
that is a compressed polyester graft is there around a nitin old stent, which is used for aneurysms, pseudoaneurysms, AV fistulas, long segment occlusion. Like uh, this is the way it looked like a yeah, yeah, scaffolding by the nitin old stent with a thin uh, layer of uh, graft around. This can be compressed into a small delivery system and delivered across uh, stenosis. Yeah, you see here a patient was had a popliteal aneurysm. This uh, patient was 86 year old with uh, other comorbidities, not suitable for open surgery. So we covered this aneurysm with a stent graft and thereby avoiding a major surgery for this patient. Uh, even angioplasty also has complications, fungicide problems, distal vessel you can dissect, you can embolize, you can produce thrombosis, rupture. So you have to be prepared for tackling all the complications immediately. And systemic complications can be renal failure. And myocardial infarction, even though we are doing under organ anesthesia, working on the blood vessels, still patient can develop MI, just like open surgery and uh, CVA. So we have to be very careful about that. And the uh, results, aortic, aortic regions, the results matched open surgery. That, that's why the open surgery is almost uh, uh, gone off. And then uh, for other aortic uh, I uh, like is pretty good. Femoropopliteal, uh, there is a tendency to reform occlusions. There are recent modifications, multiple of them have come, but I'm not, uh, I don't think it is required for you guys. So I'm not dealing with that. There are recent advances to hold that, but you must remember that uh, this is available. The shifting uh, stress is on, not on the patency of the graft, but on the limb salvage. That's what has been mentioned here. That is, patient is asymptomatic, even though the artery has occluded and uh, patient becomes maybe a uh, claudicant. From a critical ischemia, he becomes a claudicant, which can be managed by uh, medical means. That is why uh, the endovascular is applied as the first time in these patients. There are many recent advances, like uh, intra, uh, intravascular ultrasound, angioscopy, which is not very popular, but ultrasound is very popular drug eluting stents and balloons, cutting balloons, atherectomy devices, re-entry devices, and lap assisted and robotic aortic surgeries, gene therapy and stem cell for angiogenesis. I've just mentioned it for com uh, completion sake. They're being tried extensively, but not standardized. The results are also not predictable. So widespread application is not at that. So this is the uh, principle of a drug eluting balloon. Uh, and the drug is, is kind of a loader, I mean, coated on the balloon with a black taxel or everolimus, serolimus. These are the these are the ones which are all immunosuppressant drugs which reduce the intimal hyperplasia, which is the uh, which is the one which causes reocclusion. So it prevents the reocclusion and keeps the stents and grafts patent for a long period of time. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a little bit longish. Uh, I hope we have time for uh, some questions. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, the audio video is so very good and uh, of such clarity. Any any questions from the audience? Please feel free. Actually, there's one uh, question on the Facebook group, sir. And uh, uh, Dr. Shailaja from Kakinanda wants to know, is there any entity called critical limb ischemia? If it is there, how where does gangrene fit in? No, no, say that again. Uh, is there any entity? Is there an entity called critical limb ischemia? Mm. Uh, does it? Uh, where does gangrene fit in in that? Thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I told you in the beginning itself. Critical limb ischemia is any patient who has pain for two weeks, which require analgesics for relief, will be labeled as critical limb ischemia. And any patient who's got an ulcer or a gangrene, even if the uh, even without pain. Sometimes patient can, like a diabetic patient can present with a gangrene with, without pain. Whenever there is a gangrene, it becomes a critical limb ischemia. And all these patients must have a revascularization. Okay. Thank you, sir. Dr. Balu, if you have a question. Yeah, Dr. Balu. Uh, Dr. Anup Joshi. Good evening, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, uh, so may I, yeah. may I go ahead, sir? Yeah, Dr. Anup Joshi, yes. 
Uh, so my question is regarding the uh, TASC classification. Uh, so could you just explain how uh, the treatment is decided uh, based on the classification? I mean, uh, A A is uh, for endovascular or D mostly go for surgery. But what are the factors which decide uh, which treatment to take? Is it a proximal lesion requiring a more amenable to endovascular surgery or it is regarding uh, the completeness and multiplicity of the blocks? What is the deciding factor exactly? Yeah, yeah, this is a very complex question. You see, what matters is first and foremost, irrespective of the, the ulcer classification, whether it is superficial or deep, if the patient develops an ulcer and there is ischemia, it must be treated. Because a superficial ulcer, if you uh, don't treat it, don't improve the blood circulation, will become a deeper ulcer very soon. So if you catch the patient in the superficial ulcer, it is good that you treat him early enough. If the patient has proximal disease, inflow disease, that must be corrected first. So, how do you decide whether correcting the inflow disease alone is enough or we, should, we also should uh, treat the outflow disease? It's a very, very difficult question to answer. Okay. There are two, three methods that can be done. That is, you correct the, let us say, an iatoiliac disease is there. You correct that first and then you can measure the TCPO2 or ankle brachial index and see how much is the improvement that you have achieved at the ankle level. If, if you're able to get a pressure of more than 70 millimeters of mercury, that means the foot lesion is likely to heal. You don't have to treat everything uh, below. Okay. But if, let us say if the patient has higher or larger tissue loss, then it is important that we have to correct the distal disease also to get a complete improvement so that the disease does not, uh, the uh, uh, tissue necrosis does not extend further. If it is only a um, uh, superficial lesion in the uh, ulcer in the foot, then we can probably correct the inflow and then see the whether that heals. We can uh, decide on the distal one later. But if the patient comes with bigger tissue loss, you must correct the entire thing. Okay. Uh, uh, sir, but uh, what if there are no ulcers? It is just the rest pain that you're tackling. Yeah, yeah. if the patient has pain or uh, disabling claudication, you must you must do the uh, this correction. If it is only as mild to moderate claudication, you can try medical treatment. You can try medical treatment. Okay. But what will exactly decide whether to go for surgery or endovascular? There is no absolute answer for this. Yeah, it yeah. will depend see, from case. It is a million dollar question. Um, see, let uh, let me tell you. So, like iatoiliac disease, uh, yeah, surgery and endovascular carry the same kind of results. Okay. That is, uh, endovascular can produce the same kind of patency as open surgery for iatoiliac disease, except in complex iatoiliac problems. So you can do an endovascular procedure for that. But common femoral disease, surgery is much better than endovascular because that is you, you can't put a stent across an inguinal ligament. If the patient sits, mm. it will crack. It will produce acute thrombosis. So it is not wise to put a uh, endovascular for a common femoral. So common femoral must be managed uh, open surgery. For okay. SFA lesions, small anything lesion longer than 10 centimeters, the incidence of restenosis rates are much higher. So it is better if you have long lesions, you must do uh, uh, open surgery. For shorter lesions, you can try. What is most important is comorbid conditions. If the patient is healthy, hmm. has a good vein available, it is better to do surgery than endovascular. If the patient has cardiorespiratory problems and does not have a vein, hmm then it is better to do yeah, endovascular procedures. Endovascular. Thank you, sir. Because endovascular procedures are, have the, uh, the risk of uh, restenosis rate is high. So if the patient is going to spend from his pocket, it is hmm. better to offer him a single procedure which will be long lasting rather than a procedure which for which you need to do a repeat procedure after a year or so. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, DCD, what is the choice that because now the packet actual the cardiologists are moving away? What is the choice? Are you using newer drugs? 
manikanda prabhu you have no business to ask any question you are a, a you are a regular consultant vascular surgeon you have no business to ask any question <laughs> Poor, poor boy, sir. You should answer it. Guide, guide him. <laughs> Let the others do that. Vimal <laughs> Gandhi. Yeah, somebody, Sandeep. Vimal. Uh, Radha, will you repeat the questions? Because I am not able to hear when those people ask directly. Uh, they don't seem to be any more questions, sir. Uh, that is so. Then, uh, thank you so much for the uh, time spent with us, and we'll be looking forward to the next lecture, sir. Yep. Thank you. I shall close the. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yep.